thank you to uh, Dazzle for having me. And I, uh, full disclosure, I was an MGH representative from the East Coast uh, for the past session. I'm so sorry, I'm having a hard time advancing. There we go. So I work at the Athenula A. Martino Center uh, in the Charlestown Navy Yard in the laboratory of Jacob Hooker. Um, and today I'll talk to you uh, briefly about my personal experience and how I've overcome barriers to inclusion in science. I'll also discuss work on the neuroepigenetics of the brain with a view across the lifespan using the neuroimaging uh, modalities of uh, positron emission tomography known as PET and magnetic resonance imaging most of you are probably more familiar with or MR or MRI. And then I'll discuss how I leverage findings from a study in aging, um, understanding epigenetic mechanisms across the lifespan to then evaluate potential alterations in multiple sclerosis. So I have an artistic representation of aging here, and we can see that the beautiful vibrant green of our, of our brain in the early years is just so full of life. And then as we grow older, we come into an autumn and then what looks like a wintry brain on the right, we've lost our leaves. Uh, there are no birds. There's no um, kind of uh, thoughts going on there in this representation. And I'll talk to you today about what's going on underneath, which is the white matter. But I love this image and how it represents um, kind of like the changes we undergo uh, across the lifespan in natural aging. But I was an artist who became a scientist uh, later in life and fell in love with neuroscience. Uh, and then I was told I was too old to be successful, which was utterly devastating. And without getting into the details, I was able to make my way out. I'm still here. So uh, what happened or how I did it uh, and why I'm talking to you today is I, I went to my program directors and brought with me my uh, graduate union representative who argued my case with me that I should be allowed out of a lab showing um, this discrimination. Um, and I was, I was freed and I end up in a really lovely lab with a wonderful PI, Laura Vandenberg, where I studied the effects of exogenous estrogen on maternal behavior in mice. And I studied um, also the effects of uh, BPA replacement BPS, which is very structurally similar to BPA and is currently used in all of the plastics that are, uh, kind of listed as BPA replacements. And I studied this chemical because not much was known. And what I will say is that we did find alterations in brain and behavior. So here's my perspective from that wonderful lab on the right, the window that I loved. And uh, on the left, that was my view, my perspective on the left. And almost nightly, my advisor would walk in and she was just such a help because she supported me my age really didn't come up and she was supportive in talking about what had happened, but she would literally come check on me. And that was kind of my perspective. And then I had a wonderful perspective from these folks. And these, these are the members of my committee who, who defended me and um, stood by me during this time, Gerald Meyer, Mariana Pereira and Tom Zeller. And I really wanna thank them. Uh, at the same time, this is kind of the official version. So it might look like I went from really feeling like that and worse to then being in this wonderful lab, but it was really, really a path that was more like this. And it took quite a bit of this calling home, calling friends, getting support, and a lot of talking. And during the time when I was talking and seeking help from PIs to my peers, I remembered that my first PI, when I was doing my you know, transition studies in science, this was a, a kind of really um, molecular lab, and I was new to even lab. Um, and he saw my stage in life as a positive. 
So I, uh, using those memories really was, you know, very important, but I would just urge anyone uh, having any difficulties to use your resources, Re use the people you know and who you can trust. And if I can do it, you can do it. So after mm -hmm. I finished my um, uh, PhD, it was kind of a straight line to my wonderful postdoctoral mentor, Jacob Hooker. Um, and I just want to reiterate uh, at the same time, we all have to be our own advocates, our own heroes. So really you have to rely on yourself. Um, but I, I'm so grateful for all of the people who helped me. And um, I would also for today like to uh, acknowledge uh, Dante Wright because he's not here today to uh, progress in his life and undergo his life challenges. So we've had a lot of violence and uh, I'd like to thank Dazzle for this wonderful opportunity that kind of promotes um, the, 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 who is usually invisible in science to have more visibility. And I really wanna pause and remember all that who we have lost over the years to violence. And also mention that I, I also kind of work in my own way in um, women in science at the Martino Center, please visit us. But I'm on the racial justice and policy committees and we hope to affect real change. And I think Dazzle is amazing because they're actually doing something really important and taking action now. So I'll move on to my talk, I'll get back to some neuroscience. So the young adult brain is really beautifully rich with uh, white matter. And you can literally see uh, on this MRI scan image, everything you see that looks like a light gray is the white matter. And you see it connects all through the, the front to the back and the sides of the brain. And the cortex is in gray that you can barely make out, but it surrounds. And <clears throat> another view across the lifespan here is that we atrophy and our ventricles enlarge. And so we lose the white matter. And just so we're on the same page, I uh, just want some nomenclature to share. White matter is made up of myelin, uh, which has protective sheets wrapped around axons, which are like the circuits in our brain. And myelin is formed by specialized cells called oligodendrocytes, which I'll discuss with you later. So why is the white matter important? Well, uh, loss of white matter structural integrity during aging, you can see in the graph on the left, uh, as measured by diffusion, is correlated and associated with cognitive decline. So white matter is critical for network connectivity and cognitive function. So losing the white matter affects um, cognition. And the uh, other, another mechanism is through facilitation of uh, signals, like our neurotransmitter systems often suffer when we lose our white matter. However, the molecular basis underlying loss of white matter integrity is poorly understood. So we used our imaging agent called Martinostat, and I'll explain about Martinostat, to measure epigenetic signatures in the living human brain across the lifespan. So here's the molecule, and Martinostat is a radio tracer, and we inject, and it crosses the blood-brain barrier, and then the molecule binds to um, certain enzymes called uh, histone deacetylases in the human brain, and we take pictures. Um, and so Martinostat targets a subset of all the known histone deacetylases, of which there are 11. Martinostat targets HDAX1, 2, 3, and 6. And what are histone deacetylases? Uh, HDAX, uh, lovingly called, uh, HDAX regulate the expression of genes without changing DNA sequence. And uh, as many of you know, DNA is wrapped around histones. And so HDAX remove acetyl groups. So um, kind of are responsible for the closed conformation of chromatin and uh, repression of genes. Um, and more importantly, HDACs are important for cognition, implicated in neurodegenerative 
neurodegenerative disease. And of note for white matter, they're important for myelin production and remyelination. So for the first time, we're able to evaluate these proteins important for myelination in humans, in the living human brain. So we found in the aging study that histone deacetylase levels, those targeted by Martinostat, increase across the lifespan. And that increase was localized to the white matter. So we wanted to better understand what this increase in the uptake might represent. And since Martinostat allows us to measure a number of different HDAC isoforms, we wanted to find out if I could specify. So I used Western blotting um, to ask if there was an increase in HDAC one, two, three, or six in postmortem white matter, postmortem white matter, sorry, and found that HDAC one and two were increased and not three and six. So we don't know how or why HDAC one and two increase in white matter with age, but we do know from the literature that these specific HDACs are important for oligodendrocyte differentiation, myelination, and remyelination. Further, the increase in Martinostat correlates with a decrease in white matter microstructure, which is measured by another diffusion measure, general fractional anisotropy. And if you can see the, the um, kind of fiery yellow and orange is our Martinostat signal. And it overlaid with the blue bottom signals, which um, identified the loss in structural integrity. So we thought this was, all of this together was very important. And uh, think that increased levels of HDAC1 and 2 in white matter may contribute to structural and functional changes occurring during natural aging in humans. And we began to ask what cell types are involved. So there are lots of cell types in the brain, of course, but also in white matter. Um, while neurons are not uh, present in great multitude in the white matter, they're at the axons connecting are, and it's where the oligodendrocytes act in myelination. We also have astrocytes, microglia, blood, blood cells as well, um, but we formed our hypothesis based on thinking about if there's an increase in, or asking if there's an increase in HDAC1 and or 2 in specific cell types with age. Uh, is there aberrant subcellular localization of HDACs or are they simply accumulated? So just to delve a bit deeper, HDAC1 and 2 are important in oligodendrocyte differentiation and myelination. And this is going on in the nucleus. So we asked if we can confirm the increase of HDAC1 and 2 in oligodendrocytes in older versus younger donor postmortem tissue. And we began to profile cell types. Um, and so we started with oligodendrocytes and I had to use nuclear markers because it's very difficult to isolate um, cells from postmortem tissue, the whole cell. So using a number of markers, I looked at uh, HDAC1 and 2 in oligodendrocytes using fax sorting. Uh, however, so far we have not identified um, that an increase in these cell types, at least not using this method. And we're interested in this question still, of course, because of, as I've mentioned, the regulation of myelin-related genes uh, that uh, are located um, in oligodendrocytes specifically, and it's rather complicated. So we have uh, the HDAC1, which resides and functions in the nucleus, is um, recruited to promoter regions of myelin inhibiting genes. So once HDAC1 uh, is recruited, then these inhibiting genes are inhibited and then myelin production increases. So it's rather, you know, a kind of paradoxical uh, view of how HDACs operate. So this is one avenue that we'll be able to examine in the future. We still want to understand how to interpret the increase we found with age, if HDACs are dysregulated, 
Is downstream gene expression changed? And are there effects on additional cell types? Are all of these kinds of cell types or, or subset influenced in aging? So understanding the molecular signature in the aging brain carries implications for neurodegenerative and demyelinating disorders. And I hypothesize that if white matter is vulnerable to alterations in HDAX, perhaps it will be true in multiple sclerosis. So uh, we want to be able overall in our studies to reverse you know, use these readouts we get from changes in HDACs to improve therapeutics and hopefully to reverse the changes that occur due to uh, alterations to HDACs. Multiple sclerosis is a neurodegenerative disease characterized by uh, invasion of autoreactive cells from our periphery into the central nervous system, um, whereupon then uh, it attacks our cells. And uh, one of the well-known um, characteristics is damaged myelin. There are approximately 1 million individuals affected by multiple sclerosis in the U.S. and about 363 out of 1,000 people are diagnosed annually. And multiple sclerosis is characterized by demyelination and the development of lesions. And these lesions and the symptoms frequently worsen with disease progression. So for, to take you uh, into the brains of people with multiple sclerosis, here are uh, what are called flare images. So on a flare, a lesion will appear as a white. So we see here a healthy control having no lesions, but on occasion, you might find a lesion in a healthy control. Um, and disease progression in MS, in MS is measured by the expanded disability status scale, which is seen here, the EDSS. And um, so it correlates, this measure correlates with demyelination. And demyelination is, uh, in MS in particular, is accompanied by the inability for oligodendrocyte cells, uh, the progenitors, actually to differentiate. So it's not that they uh, necessarily in lesions might have a loss of these cell types, but they can't differentiate. And so the remyelination fails. Um, and here I wanna illustrate the difficulty and challenges of studying MS, understanding MS, because the neuropathology is very complicated. There's a heterogeneity of um, kind of like a scale, using the scale um, of loss in clinical measures. So this scale measures uh, clinical loss by measuring walking and reactivity to uh, stimuli um, or reflexes. And so um, someone with MS uh, for 23 years may have a relatively low score. The scores go from zero onwards and fewer lesions than someone who's had the disease for 11 years and has a higher uh, scale. And the higher you go, the kind of uh, more poorly you, you walk and uh, you have more serious effects on your gait. Um, and a lot of folks are unable to work and it's a really debilitating uh, disease. And the molecular underpinnings of lesion pathology are not well understood, and there's currently no cure. So we began to ask if there was preclinical evidence of HDOC uh, involvement in MS or related pathology. And interestingly, HDACs intersect at critical axes of demyelinating of dysregulation in MS, uh, immune function, as well as uh, myelin-related um, processes. Also, HDAC1, which functions in the nucleus in um, certain cells, in certain cell and animal models of demyelination, becomes aberrantly localized in the axon and blocking um, proper protein binding, leading to you know, um, disrupted function, as well as accumulated proteins, uh, which is a hallmark of the axonal damage found in MS. And very strong evidence exists demonstrating that 
inhibition of HDAX leads to symptom amelioration in animal models of demelination. And there are a great deal of studies uh, that show this. So we think this is very strong evidence. And then we also asked if there's evidence of uh, HDAC dysregulation in postmortem tissue and lesions and white matter. There are fewer studies in, in human postmortem tissue. One study found that HDAC3 is increased in lesions compared to white matter. And then also that uh, acetylation levels are reduced in lesions compared to normal appearing white matter, which um, these reductions Let's do a line. Um, acetylation levels are often used as a readout for an indirect readout for histone deacetylation changes. So if we see an increase in HDAC expression or density, we might expect a decrease in acetylation levels. Additionally, it's thought that lesion acetylation status appears to correlate with disease progression. And so I am hoping that Martinez stat can help with the identification of lesion and or uh, disease subtype and perhaps catch MS um, early if, if things go awry in relation to HDAX early on in the disease. So we're currently measuring HDAX in multiple sclerosis using Martinistat. And I do both age and sex match, matching with controls in multiple sclerosis um, patients. And I just wanted to show you what it looks like when I, after I kind of um, process my images. And this is what Martinistat is currently looking like. And also to assess my data, we use um, MR, as I mentioned. So here's a flare um, image that we then use to, the white here is a mask of the lesions. We use something called 3D slicer and a uh, radiologist uh, who is an expert at lesion identification um, creates these masks for me so that I can overlay the PET in my analyses and then um, get my data. I had a student also who visually inspected uh, and found most of the lesions as to be expected in the periventricular zones. This is an area of known vulnerability uh, in multiple sclerosis. But we also have patients with uh, affected regions in the thalamus, which is also very affected in MS, cerebellum and hippocampus. And so the uptake, uh, in order to measure uptake um, expression levels, we first find a normalization factor. And currently in our lab, we use the whole brain. So we use the mean from the whole brain and uh, the SUV or the initial uptake is not different. So I was able to use this factor. Otherwise I would have to have found a different um, method uh, for normalization. And using this normalization, I found a decrease in lesions upon comparing uh, lesions in uh, an NF4 to controls, as well as comparing to the patient's own uh, normal appearing white matter. I can take the uh, lesions and subtract from a, a white matter mask to give us the normal appearing white matter. Interestingly, the healthy white matter was very similar to the uh, multiple sclerosis white matter. So that's very interesting. And um, I don't really know uh, what to say or think, but that um, this may be important. I'm studying relapsing remitting um, people with MS. So, uh, you know, in in ongoing studies, we'll, we'll hopefully be able to learn if uh, HDAX can be a readout to differentiate subtypes, but we're on kind of like one subtype right now. Uh, and while we found that the HDAC levels are decreased in lesions, many lesions are close to the ventricular zones, we have to worry about something called partial volume effects from the cerebral spinal fluid. So perhaps the PET signal is lower here and it brings down and it, it's not real, there, there can, there's a concern. So we're currently working out to, to kind of test to see if we believe this result.
So understanding alterations in HDEX in white matter across the lifespan and in, in MS will hopefully provide mechanistic insight so we can improve therapeutic approaches uh, that combat degeneration, cognitive loss uh, with age and lesion pathology in MS. So as I mentioned before, the dream is to take the wintry brain and hopefully we'll be able to renew and bring about some, some, some measure of health uh, if we can better understand HDAX, if not a full bloom of the summary brain. And with that, I'd like to thank you all. I'd like to thank Dazzle, my mentor, Jacob Hooker, my colleagues in the aging study, uh, my MS study collaborators, including Katarina Monero, who's uh, also a PI and uh, mentoring me as well. Then here are my colleagues in my lab. We do like to eat together. And I'd like to thank the uh, National Multiple Sclerosis Society as well. And I'd like to thank you. <laughs>